Hello everybody. Uh, this is represents kind of the final week of our course, believe it or not. That was a short one, huh? So we're going to do the five point uh, X lecturettes. We're going to start with measuring anger and provocation and note this is closely tied to one of your assignments. So we'll be talking about that at the end of this lecturette. Real briefly here, we're going to talk about measuring anger, and it's one thing to measure anger, it's another thing to understand provocation, that is, what stimuli in the environment uh, make us angry. So we're going to, we're going to hit both of those ideas, and, and let's reflect for a moment and then move forward, because it's that point of time in the course when we should begin to reflect and, and hopefully synthesize uh, what we've learned into a cohesive narrative. At least that was my plan for us. So we're going to review Lewin's stance on the importance of theory, uh, and I want to hit that hard, and explore the environment and, and person interaction as it relates to anger and aggression. So let's first define anger. Great place to start, right? Anger is negatively toned emotion. It can range from mild annoyance, right, to fury, outrage, in response to a real uh, injury or a perceived injury or threat. And notice perception is, a, is, a, is at the heart of this, right? So anger is functional in that it causes us to change or attempt to make changes in our environment quite often. And that's one of the purposes of anger. One thing that we know anger does is it narrows the attentional focus. So for broadly perceiving the environment, when we become angry, our attention shuts really, it shuts down to this very narrow uh, perception of the target which we believe has angered us. Right? It energizes us to facilitate response, so anger is an arousing emotion, and many people will call anger an approach emotion, and it causes us to want to approach uh, whatever has instigated the anger. Now, for some people, I know uh, that, that's really an odd cartoon, but for some people, this is the truth. Some people enjoy pissing other people off, right? And we hear that now. Well, this will really own the so-and-so, right? And people are, are proud of the fact that they're pissing other people off. It really kind of, I think, represents a degradation in kindness and, and what our society potentially could be. Is this joy that results from making other people angry? I don't get it, but... Uh, and, but then imagine a world without anger. I can talk smack about anger, but then without anger, that is, people would be like free to come and take our shit away from us and we'd just be like, oh, okay, I wish you wouldn't take my shit, right? But sometimes we need to maybe get angry so that it facilitates some kind of response that, that uh, is meaningful and protective. Uh, and then that gets, now we're getting pretty philosophical, so take your own stance on that. I'm just exploring the options, huh? So anger theory, and this comes to us from Dr. Novako. Uh, I've talked about Dr. Novako before, one of my favorite professors at University of California, Irvine. I spent countless office hours with him. I mean, I, I just love Dr. Novako and hanging out with him and talking about the world, talking about his experiences as a forensic psychologist. He dealt with a lot of violent offenders, and uh, many of these offenders have issues with anger that becomes aggression. So Novako de develops an anger theory, and uh, you know, as Lewin said, there's nothing so good as a theory, and I'm going to try and sell that point here. So when we look at Novako's anger theory, uh, circa 1975, we see that there's cognitive processes and content. That's what's going around in our head, right? And there's environmental circumstances. So we understand the importance of these two, I hope, so, by now in our social psychology course, right? There's physiological arousal, and, and this is a component of the anger experience. And then what we see then is the environment affects what we think. The environment affects our physiological arousal. And our physiological arousal can affect our thinking as well as our thinking can affect our physiological arousal. So there's a relationship between all of these, a uh, multi-directional relationship. Now anger is thought to be the result of the cognitive processes and the physiological arousal. Now anger theorists will differ on this, but this is pretty solid. Most, uh, the majority of anger theorists, emotion theorists, would probably agree with this. And then the anger in this case will lead to the behavioral output. That is, we get pissed off and we might strike out, right? Now once the behavioral output Put occurs, let's say we strike out and the other person responds passively or submissively, it might diminish our anger. But notice that if we're angry and we strike out and the other person strikes us back, we could actually see the anger increase. So the behavioral output can affect the level of anger that we experience. The behavioral output also affects what we think. Were we successful in our anger demonstration? Okay, we can shut it down. Or we were unsuccessful, we might need to ramp it up. 
And notice the behavioral arousal, that is getting jacked up, balling up our fists, etc., uh, getting tense, uh, that somatic tension can cause, increase the physiological arousal. And notice our behavioral output is going to infect, affect the environment. That's really the purpose of having behavioral output is that it does affect the environment. Okay. Now, I want you to notice one thing on this diagram, though, that to me is central to understanding Novako's anger theory and also very much uh, a product of the way Novako views the world, and many of us might share this view. There is no direct link from environmental circumstances to anger. So when someone says, well, you pissed me off, guess what? This model doesn't allow for that statement. This model uh, negates that statement. You process the environmental circumstances. They may arouse you, and the combination of those two may cause you to become angry. But anger is on you. It's not on the environment. So this really forces taking responsibility. And when we look at it as a theoretical model, what does this imply for treating offenders who anger easily and then become violent as a result of that anger. You know, if they want to come and say, well, if people wouldn't piss me off, then there'd be no problem. It's like, uh-uh, uh, -uh, uh -uh. we ain't going there. What happens is you take responsibility for your anger. It is the product of you, not the product of the environment. Now, the environment can trigger cognitive processes. It can trigger physiological arousal, but the environment is not responsible for a person's anger display. So we put responsibility where it belongs. If you've got an anger problem, you have an anger problem, and it's something that you need to take care of, right? So it really puts the responsibility onto the client in, in this regard within a forensic setting, let's say. Now, let's return to Lewin, and we've looked at this slide before, but I'm a big Kurt Lewin fan if you haven't figured it out now, and behavior is a function of the person in the environment. And notice how consistent that is with this model then, that we have the person and we have the environment. So the person is represented here, right? And then the environment, and, and if we're going to then look at the behavioral output, it's a combination. So Novako's model is straight-up representation of Lewin's theory, right? And then remember the postulate to derive from this, that, that you can't change people, but you can change behavior by changing the environment. And this is a clue that we can't necessarily change people, but we can make choices about the environment. And some of us in this, you know, politically charged climate now may have kind of severed friendships, severed ties, minimized contact with certain family members because there's just no reconciliation. There's no getting along, right? So we seek to change the environment. So we need to understand how the environment affects us. And we've had a couple of assignments like that, like the stimuli evoking uh, responses. We had an assignment on that, and that's consistent with what we're doing here. Now, the Novako Anger Scale measures the general inclination toward anger reactions, consists of 48 items or divided equally into three subscales, which in turn are divided into four subsections. There's a picture of Dr. Novako, right? Snappy dresser, always wore suit and tie to class, always sharp as hell, really a class act. Uh, check it out here. Uh, so what we're talking about here, though, what Novako's talking about with the Novako anger scale is there's a cognitive subscale that measures components of anger like justification, rumination, you know, dwelling on it, not being able to let it go. Hostile attitude that primes people to be angry with minimal environmental stimulation and suspicion. Right? So what Novako is pointing us towards is there's not a one-size-fits-all anger solution. We have to understand the nature of a person's anger experience and then we'll get on to the provocations. Now, another subscale is the arousal subscale, and this measures anger intensity. So how intense does someone, uh, is their anger experience? How long does it typically last? Do they protract it or do they get over it quickly? The somatic tension is, is the bodily arousal portion of it and their general level of irritability. Another subscale is the behavior subscale that measures the impulsive reaction. So to what extent can someone control their anger or not? Right, Penelope? Huh? Yeah. So uh, verbal aggression, is that, where they, is that their go-to? Or physical confrontation? Or is it passive aggression? Is it indirect expression? Right? Like talking smack behind somebody's back. And then what is the content of their anger regulation process? How robust is it? Can you get pissed off, but can you bite it back and not display it? Might be a, a component of that. 
Now, the Navaco Anger Scale and Provocation Inventory, the one I'm going to ask you to do, and it's linked in Carmen, so you can go ahead and take this and explore your own anger. You no need to report on the results, right? Other than as it says in the assignment, we'll get to that. So go ahead and take the Navanger, Navaco Anger Scale and Provocation Inventory. There's 80 items total, each uh, describing situations that induce anger in part uh, particular individuals. There are five categories of eliciting stimuli, and maybe you can pick these out while you're doing the scale. It's not necessary. To what extent is your hot button disrespectful treatment? And notice we differ that some of us may be more affected by different stimuli in our environment than other stimuli. So some people really tuned in disrespectful treatment, right? Unfairness. To what extent are you triggered by unfairness, right? Or perceived unfairness is probably a better way to put it, right? Yeah. To what extent is frustration, and that can be trying to put together uh, some kind of device and it's not going together properly, or then, then we become frustrated, might hurl the component across the room, right? Annoying traits of others, <laughs> and I can't help but laugh at that and wonder how much I annoy my wife with some of my traits. Uh, one of my annoying traits of my father was he was a knuckle cracker, so he was always cracking his knuckles, right? It made sense. He was a musician. He was a clarinet player and saxophone player, so he was always a piano player, always using his fingers. But. And then irritations. Right? And, and note the book, Anger Control. This goes back. Navaco's written several books on this, uh, on, on anger. So assignment 13 coming from here. One paragraph for each of the following sub-prompts is what I'm looking for. Uh, let's talk first of all then, once you take the Navaco Anger Scale Provocation Inventory, the 80 item uh, test, right? Uh, overall score, and you don't have to report your overall score if you don't want to, right? Because that, that's up to you. But please comment on how you feel about it, even if you don't want to report the score. You can, you can simply say, hey, I, I think this was indicative of me, uh, or, or I don't believe it, it wasn't indicative. If you want to report the score, that's fine. It's not going to go any further than you and I, but uh, that this is still up to you, right? Do you believe that it's accurate, though? How do you feel about your score? Notice, you can say these things without reporting the score necessarily. If no, uh, uh, in, in knowing your score, does it make you want to do something to change that score? And that's one of the benefits of this. And I've really tried to design this course to be a lot about you, right? And, and so we'll take a look at this. And then, you know, do you want to use this information and to what end? That's, that's up to you. Now, next paragraph, situational triggers. Find the items uh, that responded with much or very much on that five-point scale. I believe it's five points, right? Reread those questions. Do you see a pattern on your high-level responses? If so, does this pattern then clearly dis demonstrate your hot buttons? How effective is this instrument in telling your story, communicating your story to you about you? These are the situational triggers for your anger. Some are likely more potent than others, right? And, and that's where the subscales come in. And then finally, last paragraph, type of response. Choose one dominant situational trigger and describe your typical response to that situational trigger. So it's really going back to that previous re, uh, assignment when we talked about stimulus and response. This time we're going to have the same kind of conversation in that paragraph, but I want you to focus it as inspired by the, the NASPI. Okay. Questions about that? And of course, we'll have time for questions next Tuesday and Wednesday uh, during our Zoom sessions. We also, uh, you know, so check it out as you have. And, and let's leave it with this. And Marcus Aurelius, famous Stoic, uh, if, if you're interested in Stoic philosophy, you might want to take uh, Psych of Emotion. We talk about the Stoicists quite a bit, uh, the Stoics. How much more grievous are the consequences of anger than the cause of it? And we can reflect on that, and it's a very stoic kind of thing to say. So thanks, guys, and uh, we'll talk more in the future.